Hi, in this video we're going to add Entity Framework to our .NET Web API project and I have a few slides, so let's look at them. This definition of Entity Framework is coming from the Microsoft website. Entity Framework is ORM, Object Relation Mapper, and it's a tool that lets you connect your application to a database. It doesn't just work with SQL Server database, it works with multiple other databases. You just need to load an appropriate package and you can connect to those databases too. We're going to be using model first approach and what it means, Entity Framework will create a table in a database that will represent our class that we created in our project. In this example we have this contact class and we have properties ID, first name, last name, phone address, credit card number and as you can see Entity Framework we will run a special tool, it will create a table in the database that will have columns with the same names. Before we go further, let's look at our application really quick. Our application is running and we're using Swagger UI. So we have five endpoints and all data currently is coming from this private static list and we can work with this data. So for example, if I get data, we have the three objects and I can delete one of them I'll just delete one with an ID 1. So as you can see the contact has been deleted. If I pull our data again, we have only two objects. But if I stop our application and restart it, and get our data again, as you can see we have again three objects and that's because we hard-coded this data in this list. After we're done working on this project all this data will be in the database. Let's go back to our slides. So we're gonna go through a few steps to configure Entity Framework and in the first step we'll load two packages Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQL Server and Microsoft Entity Framework Core Tools. We'll create a class, we're going to call it dbContext and you can call it anything you want. Usually you want your name to have this word context. So I've seen names like application db context or just app context db. The most important part is that this class must inherit for this db context class and this class is coming from the packages we're going to load. We're going to talk more about it when we actually work on this class. Next step is optional, we can add a seed method and that's what it means when Entity Framework create our database in our table. It's gonna seed some initial data for testing. If you don't do it, you'll just have to put data in your database manually. But I like to have this method because it's just a quick way to get data into your database so you can start testing it. We will also create a database and once we have a database, we will get a connection string from the database and we'll place it inside this app settings JSON file. The last step in configuring, we need to add something in our program CS file. And this is how we configure dependency injections in .NET Core. By doing this, this DB context class will be available to all parts of our application. Here you can see that we are using SQL Server and this connection string right here, it's coming from that app setting JSON file. After we configure it, we can start using it. So here, as you can see in our service, we're going to create this private read-only field. And after we assign it to our private field, we can start using it. So these are some methods we're going to use when we work with data in the database. As you can see in the first line, using this context instance, we have access to all data in our context table. And in this line, we're getting a record by ID. First, the default method will return us this object. And if we cannot find that object, this first to default method will return us a null. When we create our data, first five lines right here is going to be general. For any other ways, we would work with the database. But two last lines, it's specific to Entity Framework. This add method is going to add this contact object that we created to our context table, but it's actually still done in the memory. And this save changes method will go to the database and execute a SQL statement. And only after that, the new contact will be created. 
our update method will work similar. First, we're going to get that contact from the database by ID. And if we find that object and it's not equal null, we're going to update that record and the right side is coming from our an HTTP post request. And after the data is updated, we're going to use this update method and it's going to happen in the memory. And when we save changes, we're actually going to go to the database and execute a SQL statement. This is our delete functionality. So first again, we're getting that contact by ID. If we cannot find it and it's null, we're going to return false back to our controller. And if it's not null, we're going to use this remove method and it's going to be again in the memory. And in the next line, we're going to use this safe changes method that will make changes in the database. And then we're going to convert our synchronous method into asynchronous methods. And this is how one of our methods will look before we refactor it. And this is how it's going to look after we refactor it. As you can see, we're using this async await keywords. We're also converting our to list method to list async method. And also instead of returning a list of our contact DTO objects, we're going to return a task of that list. I'm going to go back so you can compare. This is the original and this is the modified method. So let's get started building this application. If you were building it with me in the last two videos, you can just continue working on it. But if you didn't do it, you can just get it from GitHub and start working on it that way. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you how to pull it from GitHub and get it running and then we'll start modifying it. Let's go to GitHub. This is our address book web API application. I'm going to place this link in the description of our video. So we're going to click on this code button. We're going to leave it at HTTPS and I'm going to copy this link. So I'm going to just click on this button, copy URL to clipboard. I created a folder on my C drive and I call it address book with entity framework. I'm going to click in the address bar just once and I'm going to type CMD, enter. And it's going to open the terminal. And as you can see, I'm already inside this folder. So in here, I'm going to type git clone. And I'm going to paste that line from GitHub. I'm going to press Control V and enter. If I go back to my folder, as you can see, I have my project. So I'm going to go inside this folder. And this is my solution. I'm going to right click on it. Open with Microsoft Visual Studio 2022. Let's run our application to make sure it works. And let me test it. I'm going to try it out, execute. As you can see, we have an array of three objects. Let me close it. And I'm going to go to Solution Explorer. I'm going to pin it to the screen. And let's look at the structure of our application. I'm going to inside our controllers folder and I'm going to double click on our context controller. So this is where we have all our endpoints. And I'm also going to go to our services and I'm going to open our contact service. This is where our data lives for right now. And before we start modifying it, let's do a little cleanup. I created this better context service just to demonstrate how dependency injections work. So let's just delete it. So let's look inside first. So this is a service without any implementation. It was just for demonstration purposes. So I'm going to right click here. I'm going to say delete. Okay. And another thing we're going to delete is the automatic config file. In the last video, we decided that we're going to use my mapper instead of automapper config. So I'm going to delete that file. And I'm going to go to our NuGet packages and remove this automapper extensions Microsoft dependency injection package. So I'm going to click uninstall apply. Okay, and let me look at our contact service to make sure nothing is broken. So since we don't have it already, so let me remove this using statement. So I'm going to just click on it and press control X. I don't need this control X. Going to remove this. And I'm going to remove this control X. I don't need all these two. So I'm going to remove that. Let me save it and let me run it to make sure everything works. Let me see what's wrong. In our program CS, we don't need this line for our auto mapper package. So let me delete that. Let me save it. I press Control S. Let me run it. 
and our application works as intended. Let's now start working on adding Entity Framework to our application. As you remember in the first step, we're going to load two packages. I'm going to right click on our address book API project, manage NuGet packages. I'm going to click on browse and I'm going to type Microsoft Entity Framework or SQL Server. It actually is already here. I'm going to click on it. Right now, if I click install, it's going to give me an error. Let me show you. And the reason for that, because I'm trying to install the wrong version. If we go back to our slide, you can see that it says appropriate version after load NuGet packages. And since we're using .NET 6, I'm going to go to .NET 6, the last number, 6025, and I'm going to install that. Apply, accept. As you can see, it installed it successfully. Let's now install the second package. And I actually don't even need to type anything. It's right here. Microsoft Entity Framework Core Tools. Same thing. I need to choose the right version. I'm going to do the same thing. 6025. Install. And now we have two packages that we need. So here it actually shows two updates. And we actually don't want to update it because it's going to break the application. You only want to update it if you update the whole project to .NET 8. Let me close this tab. We don't need it anymore. And let's look at our second step. We need to create a DB context class. And it's going to inherit from this DB context class. I'm going to create this class inside this folder models. So I'm going to right click on this folder and I'm going to say add class and I'm going to call it DB context. Enter. So we need to do a couple more things here. First, we're going to create a constructor and I'm going to type CTOR and I'm going to press tab. As you remember, my DB context class needs to inherit from the DB context class that comes from the NuGet package. So I'm going to bring this using statement and inside our constructor, I'm going to type DB context options and the name of our class. So it's DB context space options. And here I'm going to go outside of parentheses and I'm going to put column base options. I already have curly braces, so I don't need those. So that would be all for our constructor. And below that, I'm going to list all classes I'm going to use to create tables in our database. So to do that, we're going to use property with a type of DB set. So I'm going to say public DB set. And in triangle parentheses, I'm going to put our class contact. And IntelliSense helps me. I'm going to just press tab here. We're going to talk about it. So this context word will be used for the name of our table in the database. And usually for the name of our table, you use the same name, but plural form. So if our class is contact, our table name will be context. In our application, we have only one class, so we'll need only one table in the database, but you can have multiple data sets here with different classes and different names for data tables. Let me save it and let's go to our contact class and modify it a little bit there. If we leave everything as it is, the table in the database will be created and it will be created with the default settings. We can actually modify it to make it better. For example, if we leave it like that for the first name, the data type for this property first name will be nvarchar with the maximum length. We usually don't want it because it's going to take too much memory in the database. So we're going to use data annotations to modify those data types in the database. So what we're going to do, square brackets, and we're going to type max length in parentheses. Let's make it 50. Also, our first name is probably required because we don't want to have a record without the first name. So we can also set it as a required field. Let's do the same for other fields too. I'm going to just copy paste it. So control C, control V, and I'm going to do it for all fields. The phone number will probably be shorter. So let's change it to 20. And for the address, let's make it 200. Let's see if the length for the credit card is 50, but let's not make it required. 
And to make sure that it's not a required field in the database, we're going to make it nullable. And so at the end of this string data type, we're going to put a question mark. Now let's talk about this ID. This ID can have any name, but if you put this exact spelling, capital I in law case D, entity framework will make it the primary key and it will be auto incremented. If for some reason you want to change it to something else, for example, if you want to say contact ID, you need to add data annotations here too. So I would probably put a keyword key. And now Entity Framework will know this, this contact ID is our primary key and it's going to be also order incremented. Since we are going to leave our name as ID, I don't need this, so I'm going to just remove it and I'm going to save it. Let's go to our next step. We're going to create our seed method. So let's go back to our DB context class. I'm going to make some space and it's going to be protected. Override, return type void. The name is on model creating in parentheses model builder type and the name is going to be model builder here and here I'm going to remove that I'm going to type model builder dot entity and it's going to be of type contact so I'm going to just press tab dot has data parentheses and I'm going to put semicolon at the end and I'm going to break it down. And here we're going to create a few objects and that data will end up being in our table when the table is created. Let me just go to our contact service and grab the data from here. So I'm going to just copy all that. Control C. I'm going to come back here and I'm going to press Control V. And I'm going to remove these lines. Control X, Control X. And I'm going to save it Control S. And let me format it a little better. I think it looks okay. So this part is done. Let's go to our next slide. On this step, we're going to create a database and we're going to extract a connection string. After that, we're going to place our connection string inside our app setting JSON file. There are a couple ways you can create a database. You can use a Visual Studio built-in tool, the SQL Server Object Explorer. If you don't have it, you can go to this view and click on SQL Server Object Explorer. So it's going to be on your left panel. Let's pin it to the screen. So I'm going to click on this little pin. If you don't have anything here, you would have to click on this icon at SQL Server. And you're going to go to this local Microsoft SQL Server local DB. The name will be like this by default and choose Windows authentication. There are a few options, but you need Windows authentication and you can leave just the laptop name at the same and you'll just click connect and you'll have this option, the same option that I have. Now, if you expand this local DB, the first option and go to databases, you will not have anything. I already have one test database here and here we can start creating databases. This is our first option. If you want, you can use Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio to do the same thing. And when you come here, you would have to put database engine and choose Windows authentication in this option. And after you click connect, you're going to have the same thing here. I'm going to use this option for now because it's easier to see here in the same project. So I'm going to right click on databases. I'm going to select add new database and I'm going to type the name of the database and it's going to be address book DB. Press enter. So I now have this empty database. So if I go inside and inside tables, I have some default tables that we usually never touch and we don't need to create any tables. We could create a new table, but we don't need to do it because entity framework will create it for us based of this contact class. Now to access this database, we need a connection string and to find it, we're going to right click and select properties. Here, as you can see, I have a connection string option. So I'm going to double click on it and I'm going to copy it. I'm going to press control C and let me put in a notepad so we can look at it. I'm going to paste it here, control V. And as you can see, it's a long connection string. And that's what we're going to be using in our project. Let me minimize it for now. I'm going to close that. We don't need it. And we're going to go to our solution explorer. And here we're going to double click of app setting JSON. Let me unpin this thing. And here after allowed hosts, we're going to put a comma, go to the next line and in quotation marks, I'm going to type connection strings. And as you can see, IntelliSense is helping me. So press tab, curly braces and inside curly braces. I'm going to in quotation marks, I'm going to type default connection. 
and you can call it anything you want. I'm calling it default connection column. And inside these quotation marks, I need to go back to our notepad. I'm going to copy the whole thing. Control C, go back and I'm going to click inside those quotation marks. Control V. And I'm going to make sure I save it. This step is done. Let's look at the next step. In this step, we're going to configure entity framework in our program CS file. And here before our add controllers method, I'm going to type, let me put a comment first, actually. I'm going to say configuring entity framework. And I'm going to type builder services add db context. And here I'm going to put the name of our db context class parentheses. And I'm going to say options options dot use SQL server parentheses. Let me put semicolon here and I need to bring a using statement. And inside I need to bring connection string. And the way we do it, we're going to type builder configuration dot get connection string. And inside quotation marks, we're going to type the name of our connection string and I named it default connection. I'm missing one parenthesis. Let me save it. And after this, we can start using entity framework anyway in our application. Before we continue, let me do a little cleanup here. So I'm going to remove this two lines because I left it just for training purposes when we were looking at dependency injections. I'm going to remove this line too. So I think it looks much cleaner now. Let me save it and let's go to our next step. This step shows you how we can start using our entity framework. But before we do it, we need to create a mapping between our application and the database and we need to actually create a table corresponding with our class. We're going to be using a package manager console. And if we don't have it here, you can go to tools, NuGet package manager and click on this package manager console. And to create a table in our database, we need to run a certain command. Let's go to the Microsoft side and look at those commands. This is the website and I'm going to put in the description for this video. If we scroll down, it will give you two options. You can do it using .NET CLI. Usually use it when you develop your application using VS Code. But since I'm using Visual Studio, I'm going to click on this tab and I'm going to just copy this line. Let me copy it, go back to our application. I'm going to place it here. And this is the name of our so-called migration. We can call it anything we want. I'm actually going to call it initial. And when we run our command, let's just run it to see what happens. Entity framework created this folder migrations and inside this migrations folder we have two files. This is our model snapshot. Let's look at that. That actually maps our class to our table in a database. And this file after we run our next command will create a table in a database. So let's go back to our package manager console. Let me go to our database so we can see that we don't have anything here. So we're going to go to our package manager console and we're going to run our next command. And our next command is going to be update database. I'm going to press enter. And if I refresh our database, I'm going to right click on it, refresh. As you can see, I have two tables. Let's look at this table first. View data. As you can see, we have the name of our migration right here. And this is our table, view data. We have a table, plus we have the data that we put inside our seed method. So if we go back to our DB context class, after the table was created, this data was placed inside the table that was created. Now let's look at the columns. I'm going to just click on this little arrow. Columns. Let me expand it a little bit. As you can see the type of the data for our first name and varchar 50. And I hear different pronunciations and varchar and varchar. And this is not null because we put that this data will be required. And it's true for all these fields with the exception of this credit card number. This field is not required and can be null. Now let's talk just a little bit about these two commands we used. So one command was add migration and update database. These two commands are coming from our NuGet package tools that we installed. Let me go back there. 
this package, Microsoft Entity Framework Core Tools, will allow you to execute those commands. If for some reason you forgot to bring this package, and if you try to run these commands, you're gonna get an error. There's another important thing I wanna tell you, so let me close everything by this one so we don't have it crowded here. And let me bring this back. So in the process of your database development, if you realize that you forgot to add something, for example, if you go to your contact class, and if you need to add a bunch of properties here, you could create another migration and update your database, or in the very beginning when you're just creating your database, you can actually start all over. And to do that, you just need to delete this migrations folder. So I'm gonna just delete it. I'm also gonna delete the whole database. You can delete only the table or you can just delete the whole database. And the reason why I can delete the whole database because our connection string has the name of the database and it's gonna look on our local server. And if it doesn't have the database, it's gonna just create the database with this name. Let me show you really quick. If I go to app settings right here in the initial catalog, it said the name is address book DB. So let me show you, let me just delete this database. I'm gonna right click, delete. The database is deleted, so I don't have those migrations. I don't have the database, so I'm gonna go back to our package manager console. And I'm gonna just use arrow up to get back to our add migration initial. I'm gonna press enter, run the command, and I'm gonna go to our update database command, run it, so enter. I'm gonna refresh our server, so refresh. As you can see, I have my database. I'll go inside, inside the tables, I have the same tables. And to make sure, let's look at our table. Now we have the same table, the same data. At this point, we have everything we need to start working with our data using Entity Framework. But before we do it, let's create one more migration so you can see how it works. I'm gonna go to our context.cs file. And let's say our database is already in production and we decided that we need to add one more property here. Let's say we wanna add middle name to our class. I'm gonna just copy all this, paste it here, and I'm gonna change first name to middle name. Let me save it. Now, in our table, we don't have this column yet. So let's fix that. So we're gonna go back to our package manager console and I'm gonna use add migration command and now I'm gonna call it edit middle name. Press enter. Let's look at our migrations. So I'm gonna go to this folder. As you can see, I have a new migration here. Our database is not affected yet because we need to run our next command. So I'm gonna just say update database. And if I refresh our table, I'm gonna right click, refresh here. And as you can see, we have an additional column middle name. So if I come here too, and I'm gonna click refresh, I can't see anything here, but that's because I actually need to close it and open it again. The only thing I would make different, since we're adding our middle name later, I would probably make it not required. So let me go to our contact class. And here I would remove this required property. And I would put a question mark right here. And this is the case where I would probably just remove the whole database. Let me do it. Delete. And remove this migrations folder. And I would run this initial migration again. So add migration initial update database. Let me refresh our server. This is our tables. Let's look at the data. As you can see, we now have a middle name. And our middle name can be null, so the field is not required. Let's run our application to make sure everything compiles. Our application compiles, but this data is still coming from our service class and it's hard-coded. Let's go back to our application and change it. I'm gonna unpin this and I'm gonna close all these tabs and I'm gonna open our contact service. 
As you remember our slide, we need to inject our context class via constructor. Let's create here private read-only field. In our constructor, we're going to inject it here. Let's call it context. And inside our curly braces, we're going to place this line. So we're bringing our context here in the constructor and we're assigning it to our private field right here. So let's start using it. Let me comment out all this so it doesn't confuse us. I can press Ctrl K, Ctrl C, or I can go up to this menu and click on this icon. So now our context variable is on the line. So let's fix that. So we're going to create a new variable and we're going to call it context. And we're going to use our DB context. So underline DB context dot. As you can see, I have this context property on the list. And this represents our table in our database. So I'm going to type context dot. So before I type two lists, let me just put semicolon. And as you can see, I don't have any arrow here. But here I get an error. The reason for that is that until we call this method to list, the data won't be extracted from the database. And this is how we actually can build more complicated queries before we actually execute on the database. For example, if I leave it like that, and I'm going to create a new variable, I'm going to call it filtered context. And I'm going to use this context variable that I just created before. And I'm going to use this method where, and let's say I want to get all records where first name starts with J. I'm going to say record and I can call it anything I want. Record first name. And there's method starts with. And I'm going to just put letter J. It's still now in the memory. And if I want to get the data actually from the database, I have to add to list. And this is where Entity Framework will actually go to the database and execute the statement that will give me this filter context data. So it's not going to be two statements. It's just going to be one statement. So here I would just have to put it in here. And this is what we would do if we want to build our more complicated query. If you want to dig deeper, you can look up the difference between i queryables versus i enumerables, and you can find a lot of information about it online. Let me just undo everything so we don't need all this code. So I'm going to here say to list, and I'm going to replace this filtered context with context. Let's update our get contact by ID method. This is going to be really easy because all we need to do, we just need to replace this. I'm going to just delete it with this DB context, context, control C, and I'm going to place it here, control V. So what we are doing, we're telling entity framework to go to the database, to this table context, and we're using this method first or default to find our contact with this ID that we are passing in this method. And if the data is found, it's going to be converted into an object. So that's going to be our object of type of contact. And if the data is not found, this method first or default will give us null. So this contact variable will be equal to null. So that's all we need to do here. In this create contact method, we need to make a couple changes. So up to this point, it's going to be all the same. Here, this context, we need to replace with this part, db context dot context, control C, double click, control V. And after that, we need to add one more line. We are going to say db context, save changes. It happened to me in the past. I would forget this line. And when I'm testing, I don't get any error, but my database wouldn't have a newly created contact. And the reason for that, this is done in the memory and only after this line is being executed, Entity Framework goes into the database and runs a SQL statement that would put that newly created contact in the table. Let's go to our update contact. Here first on line 61, we first get the contact from our database by this ID. So we need to change it again to db context context. And after line 67, 
we are going to add another line to be context context and instead of add method we need to use update method and again the same thing at the end after we did it in the memory we need to go to the database and update our table so this is done delete contact will be similar so I'm gonna replace this part I'm gonna replace this context with the same db contact context and we have the remove method and again at the end we need to save our changes in the database I think this is it let me run our application and let me see if we can get the data from the database this is our data let's add a record create contact try it out we'll actually need to modify our code to work with this id i will show you what i mean so for now let's just put here test first name test last name for phone number let's just do and for address let's press execute it actually worked let's look at our application how we're doing it here even though we're assigning an ID to this object from here, Entity Framework ignores it and creates its own ID. So let's go to our database view data. As you can see, the ID is four. So Entity Framework incremented this ID by one and assigned it to this record. So in our code, we actually can remove this line completely. Let me stop it and restart it. Let's create one more contact to make sure it works. Execute. So the data was created. Let me go to our old context method. Execute. As you can see, we have this new record with ID 5. Let's modify our last record to make sure everything works. Update contact, try it out, and we need to send the ID, so it's gonna be ID 5, and it's gonna be, I'm gonna just say update test. Let's execute it, and let's get our data here. As you can see our record was updated and let's test our last method we're gonna just delete our record with ID 5 execute it so here it says the contact has been deleted and if we execute all context method as you can see we have only four records now in the next step, let's talk about converting our methods into asynchronous methods. This is an article on the Microsoft website, and I'm going to place this in the description of this video. The basic idea behind asynchronous programming is that you don't want to lock your application while it's accessing data in a database. We're going to use the await keyword in our methods, and let's go back to our application and do it really quick. I'm going to unpin this. And I'm going to get our controller here. First of all, we need to convert all our action methods into asynchronous methods. So the way we do it, we're going to use the async keyword. And this async and await words, they always use as a pair. Now the return type is going to be a task. So we're going to put task here. And we're going to put this I action result inside the triangle pair of brackets now it's underlining it because we need to go to our service and do some work there so i'm going to go to our contact service and let's convert this method to so i'm going to say async and i'm going to await this and instead of to list i'm going to say to list async and it looks like i need to bring a using statement here and the return type is going to be also a task task extra triangle brackets so let me save it okay and it looks okay but we have an error here and as you remember from previous videos we're using this interface 
independency injections. So we need actually to go there. I'm going to right click and say go to definition and I need to change the signature. So I'm just go back and I'm going to copy all this and I'm going to go back to this interface and I'm going to replace get all contacts with this line. I don't need this async word here. Let me save it. Let me go back. So here it works OK. Here no errors. And now let's go to the next method. So same thing. We're going to add a sync await. We're going to change this first to default async. And we're going to change this return type contact DTO into task. So we're going to go to our controller now and do the same thing here. Sync. Wait, and this is going to be a task. And I'm going to do the same everywhere else really quick. And let's go to our contact service and make changes here too. Now here, the only method we need to change is save changes because this add method is being done in the memory. So we need to make it a sync only if it goes to the database. So save changes async right here. Update contact. Gonna make it to task. Save changes async. First to default async. And the last one, save changes async. And we now need to go to our interface. Let me just split it to the right side and adjust all those methods. So for delete contact, it's going to be right here. Semicolon. Update contact is going to be from here. semicolon. For create contact it's going to be this part. And the last one get contact by ID. Let's replay this part. Semicolon. Let me save. Let me close it. And let me stop and run our application again to see if it all works. Alright, let's look if we can get all contacts. Try it out, execute. So we have four records. We're going to create a new contact. We're going to call it test five. And I'm going to just place it everywhere here. Execute. Let's look if we have it in a database. So we have our test 5 and ID 6. So let's get this record with ID 6. We're going to use our contact by ID method. Try it out. ID 6. Execute. It works. We got our object. Let's update our contact. And we're going to update the same one with ID 6. And we're going to say update test. And let me just copy paste everything. Execute. As you can see, everything was updated. And just to make sure, let's look at it. So everything was updated. And the last test, let's delete our contact. Again, ID 6. Execute. The contact has been deleted. Let's just go to the database and see if everything is right. Let me refresh. As you can see we have four objects, IDs 1, 2, 3 and 4. I hope this video was helpful and thank you for watching.